and thank you for serving uh, uh, God's people through Bible TV. Uh, brother, I'm so happy and very delighted that you are in this Asian Gospel Show. If you remember that uh, I have started this uh, program in 2003 and by the grace of God, uh, now it's becoming very successful. And uh, it's a great honor and great privilege for all of us that uh, you are uh, in this uh, program. Before I will uh, go further, tell us something about your ministry, uh, about your work, how you came into ministry and uh, uh, about your spiritual journey. That will be very, very interesting uh, for our viewers. So over to you. First of all, you mentioned about Miyamali. Yes, anything good can come from Miyamali. Yes, and Prime Minister you mentioned and Ms. Bulhak also is from Miyamali. So Miyamali has produced uh, very good personalities and I am one of those uh, personalities from the Christian community from Miyamali. I was uh, born and brought up Christian, Catholic Christian for the last four generations. Uh -huh. When I was uh, 17, I got God's call and I felt that God is calling me to serve. And then I said yes to my Lord Jesus Christ. I spent two years in Hushpur to be trained as a catechist. Then two years in Lahore Minor Seminary and six years in Christ the King Seminary, Karachi. It was my passion to be a priest because from my childhood, being an altar boy and looking at the missionaries who came in our country, especially in our diocese, male Hill missionaries, were my role model and inspiration. I wanted to serve like them. And I wanted to be a celibate priest. I was so passionate that I used to pray that Lord ordain me at the age of 30 and give me only three years so I can turn this world upside down. I can bring revolution. But God didn't hear my prayer. When I was 29 and a half year old, I had this accident. Because that, that was a very terrible uh, incident in your life because you was in the seminary in Karachi, I believe. Yes. And, uh, tell us something about that because most of uh, your friends and our viewers, uh, they will be very interesting in that, uh, in that uh, incident, you know, because it gives you so much strength, you know, even after that incident, you were so committed uh, with your calling and you continue your ministry. Yes, I dive in the swimming pool, my eardrum was damaged. I had a surgery in Karachi. Mm -hmm. He put the eardrum but damaged my facial nerve. And facial nerve is connected with five nerves which control your eyebrows, your uh, uh, cheeks, your lips, your nose. Uh, since there was no blood circulation coming from this side, I, I, my, uh, I had this uh, flat uh, side, completely paralysis on this side. That was very disappointing. I nearly lost my faith, my family, my parents, they nearly lost their faith because they have given their young son, elder son yeah. to serve the Lord. And the big question was why this has happened to our young boy. Mm -hmm. So that was something very hurting to me and to my family. I went from Lahore, Punjab, Karachi to Frontier. Wherever people say this doctor is good, I used to go and uh, um, see him or her, but there was no cure. One of the doctors suggested me to come to England. Then I asked nurse um, uh, sisters from uh, St. Raphael's Hospital, Faisalabad. And they got the quotation from Harley Street doctor. And that quotation was 40,000 pounds. Just imagine 22 years ago. Yeah. 40,000 pounds was a huge, huge amount. And then I asked my bishop. My bishop said, I can't afford 40,000 pounds. I don't have any 40,000 pounds. 
of course it was a huge amount at that time it was a very very huge amount and i don't believe him but i was so disappointed when i was disappointed i left everything in the hands of god when i left everything in the hands of god knowing that he is the god of providence yep. god sent the whole plastic surgeon teams from middle middlesbrough from england to peshawar yep. and somebody rang me in the morning and they said a plastic surgeon team has come to visit all the way from england to peshawar why don't you go and visit them eventually i went there but it was very very difficult to approach to them while i was finding the resources one of the catechist he said my daughter in law is working in this hospital should i ring ring her i said yes he just rang her and uh, luckily his daughter in law was working with the same team mm -hmm. and she made an appointment all these uh, uh, ministers and chief ministers and all everybody we left behind and there was 500 people in the queue and i was number 5 the head of the department he checked he examined me and he selected me for the operation he said day after tomorrow you are going to have surgery i was very happy i came home and as i was going to eat my dinner the phone rang again and they said the doctors are going to abbottabad your operation is going to be tomorrow morning so you have to come quickly so eventually i went back to peshawar i met this doctor and before the surgery he said this is very fine and complicated operation for this you have to come to england see how god works yeah he said can you afford i said no because 40000 pounds were in my mind he said can you afford your ticket i won't charge anything any fees i said okay i will try and then eventually i will I, in my heart i said i don't want to lose this opportunity and he said you are a man of god you trust in god trust in me as well hallelujah and then within 6 months he sent me the uh, paperwork and everything and i got a visa for 6 months i came here i wanted to see london before i uh, uh, was going to have my surgeries in middlesbrough while i was in london when i arrived i rang him and i got to know that he got serious heart attack oh my god and he said i have to wait for 6 month i had only 6 month visa what am i going to do mehil missionaries they supported me a lot in london i was staying with them mm -hmm. and then i said what am i going to do and then after 6 month he said i can't do your operation at all because i got retirement from nhs oh. but he sent me to a doctor in harley street in london mm -hmm. and can you believe he was the same doctor who sent me the 40000 pounds quotation in pakistan see how god works yeah he knew me as soon as he heard my name falak shair from pakistan he said i know you i sent your quotation <laughs> my god where can i get this 40000 pounds for his fees and then god bless missionary uh, milhil missionaries at that time i had some saving my father got early retirement he gave every single penny to me to send me for my treatment god bless him too he is uh, uh, resting in peace in heaven and milhil missionary said you cross the first bridge and god will help you for the rest because there was a four stages operation yep. each stage i have to pay 10000 pound so i went through four sur major surgeries even on my first surgery in 
I was looking for photographs and I sent it to Reverend Noble Samuel as well because um, he was there. He came to bless me in the war, in the, in the room. And um, God bless you, uh, Reverend Noble, for your great support. Thank you very much. And uh, I went through course and God provided me the best doctor in the world who discovered this microsurgery. And God provided me the best hospital in London, near Lord's Cricket Ground. St. John's Hospital. So that's what inspired me. Once God <clears throat> provided me all these, these resources, I gained my faith. Because I strongly believed that God, we believe, is the God of providence. Once what you which, uh, hand, which hand over to him, he, yeah. he look after you. One thing which I noted at that time, uh, even in that uh, period of trial, you know, and the uh, agony and the suffering, you were so confident and you were so jolly, you know, all the time you was laughing and playing with, the, with my son and uh, uh, never ever you complained for anything, you know. That was, that was so amazing. And so many times I was thinking, why he is so confident? What is a driving force? So can you, can you share? Because you, you mentioned that to your parents and you yourself, uh, on one stage, you lost that faith, and there was a lot of aggression and anger inside. Why it's happened to you? So, what was actually in your mind when I had this incident that happened during Lent season? Mm -hmm. And during the Lent season, we used to reflect on the suffering of Christ. And in my bag, I always had the picture of Jesus face, mm -hmm. suffering face, the crown on his head. Yep. When I look at my face, I look at the face of Jesus. And I used to say, for luck you are not beautiful than Jesus. You are only son of Piara Bharti, but he was a son of God. Yeah. When I looked at his face, that face always inspired me and consoled me at that time yes. because I remember how he was being slapped on his face, spat on his face, blood on his face. His face was disfigured. It's a very emotional testimony and uh, I believe that um, it's not easy to share all these uh, experiences. But I think for some people, it is very, uh, very good and uh, uh, for the sake of uh, their uh, spiritual experiences, I think your testimony is playing a very important role in their uh, life. And I, I myself, I, I learned so many things from your character, from your lifestyle. Because uh, uh, I remember that when you was in uh, Birmingham, I just want to share with my viewers that he been in uh, Salio Colleges in Birmingham University. And he studied in the Leeds University as well. And he completed his logical education from Salio Colleges. Um, George Kavur, he was your principal at that time, lovely person. And uh, you was very close uh, to that family as well. Do you uh, believe that sometimes people, those who are coming into our life, they are giving us some inspiration and uh, they are driving force for us, people like George Kavur and uh, some other people, those who played a very important role in your life? People who had uh, helped me throughout my journey, I never forget them. Bishop Manur is one of them. Right from my childhood, all those priests who have done great, great work in my life. When I came here, I can't forget Mill Hill priests. I can't forget Phil Simpson from CMS. Yes. Yes. George Kabur, Bishop Manur Malsha. And uh, including yourself, Reverend Noble Samuel. Thank you so much. You were the people who inspired me, who always gave me courage. And it was God's love in my heart and the spirit of God. Mm. Always helped me to keep my head up. Although, although I was going up and down, being a human, I was uh, frustrated, I was feeling lonely, away from family, 
no friends here. I, all the friends, when I came in this country, only male hill priests were the only people, people known to me, but no other friends. But now the whole England is my friend and my family. The family love. The reason, uh, the reason, man, uh, the reason for the function, I'm asking you this question because we need to be very, very selective uh, about our friendship. Zara, please come back. <laughs> She's a daughter of uh, Father Felix Shea, uh, eldest daughter. She got, he got two uh, daughters and uh, I believe one wife. <laughs> uh, the daughters are so beautiful, so pretty. Uh, I mean, these things are very, very important when the good people, they are uh, coming to your life and they are helping you in your crisis. And uh, I think it, this is very important that you should have a good people around you. Now, uh, after completion of your theological education, you started your ministry in uh, Manchester, which is a multiracial, multicultural, uh, metropolitan city. So what is your experience of working in that wider community? In the uh, white community and in the Asian community, what sort of experience you have there? Uh, as I said, I'm thankful to CMS, mm -hmm. the Church Mission Society society helped me to broaden my vision because when i started working with cms church mission society in london then they sent me to crowther hall that's uh, church mission society's missionary college no it's no more um, uh, cms now when i went in that college i studied about anglicanism and a CMS who converted me from Catholicism to Anglicanism. So that's the wide, that's the experience of the wider church I had in Selyuk. And then I, when I studied about Anglican, Anglicanism, when I went to different churches in uh, Anglican churches, and I felt at home with them as well. And I, I saw there's a light outside the Catholicism as well. Yeah. We are, and that's how I, I started studying about Anglicanism. And I felt that I can be a priest, but I can be a married priest. Because I was feeling so lonely and depressed. And I thought celibacy is a big cross. Mm. which I'm not able to carry on my own. So eventually I got married mm -hmm. and God has blessed me with two daughters, Zara and Zoe, as Father Sab has mentioned. Yeah. So their Lovely. one is uh, nine year old and the youngest one is uh, six year old. And my wife, Rina, is a real drive behind my ministry. Yeah, we will talk about that. And, uh, but at the moment, we are talking about your cross-culture ministry. You've been in Lahore. I think you're working with the with the Manchester uh, uh, with the Lahore Diocese because there is a partnership uh, Manchester Diocese and the Lahore Diocese. Tell us something about that. I got. Um, I'm a people's person, and uh, as I said, I was 17 when I started my training. I was 18 and uh, 19 when I completed my catechist training. And as soon as I finished my catechist training, I, I cannot go to bed without doing the meditation. And I was doing the meditation and the voice came. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. Mm -hmm. And that brought my memories, childhood memories. When my dad was in prison, in prison and even he was in a death, cent a death cell. I believe he was in the police uh, as well. He was in a uh, he, he was in a police. Something happened, but he was uh, in the prison in the death cell, uh, and he was uh, in a death cell. Okay. From my childhood, when I was seven or eight, I used to go and visit him in the prison. Okay. Eventually, he was released. He was, um, um, he was free from the um, uh, sentence and he was um, proclaimed like um, uh, no guilty. But those memories of my childhood 
imp were imprinted in my mind. And when I read this, I was in prison. You didn't visit me. Straight away, I went to Mianwali prison. That was the first prison I visited as a, as a pastor. So prison ministry, I started, you talk about the uh, wider experience. So prison ministry, I started there. That was the place where I met all sort of people. That is the place where you can see the face of Jesus in different, different people. So I've been to every single prison in Pakistan. All right. As a seminarian, as a priest, because I was a prison chaplain in Pakistan. And even, even when I came in this country, I've been to every single prison in England as well. Because I did my thesis on uh, counseling behind bars. And that took me to every single prison here. So that was one of the wider experience of working with different sort of people I had in my life. And the prison ministry is very much in the heart of my, uh, uh, in my heart. Then I worked with uh, different denominations within the Church of England. I was born and brought up Catholic. As I said, I was, um, uh, uh, I'm a trained Catholic priest in Pakistan. I completed my study. But I came here. Well, you, you are very effective in the ecumenical relationship over there in Manchester. I'm very much. I'm very much. Because um, once your foundation is um, uh, very strong, and I'm thankful to Rome, the Roman Catholic Church has impacted me a lot because they have trained me well. Once you've got the strong roots, once your roots are very strong, you can adjust yourself anywhere and you can grow anywhere uh, uh, you are, even from the stones and thorns and everywhere you are, because you are well rooted into the traditions and into the spirituality. And I'm thankful uh, to Roman Catholic Church who trained me very well and I'm rooted well and I can um, uh, live and uh, establish myself anywhere in any denomination. Apart from that ecumenical relationship and uh, your ministry in, in the prison, uh, you had a wider experience of the interfaith uh, work, you know, you were an interfaith practitioner and I have seen your picture that uh, you was very much involved in the interfaith dialogue and uh, not only uh, in uh, Manchester but in Pakistan as well. So do you think that uh, that interfaith relationship uh, in the metropolitan city like Manchester or some other cities like London, it's so vital? Basically, uh, many times we misunderstand the religion. The basic religion is humanity. Mm -hmm. Under the skin, we are all the same. The first of all, we need to keep the relationship with one another. And being a Christian and Pakistani Christians, we've been all evangelists in Pakistan. From the childhood, you encounter with Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs. And the town, Miyawali, I belong to, all my neighbors were Muslims. And we lived as a family. Mm -hmm. We argue, we talk, we share our faith, we share our traditions. And that gave me confidence. And I studied about Islam as well. And that gave me confidence to talk with them and about their faith. Because no matter, you don't want to talk about faith, eventually this is our Asian culture. We end up talking about religion. And that mm -hmm. gave me a broader vision. And I've been working in, for interfaith in Pakistan. I've been working for interfaith here because I established this Harmony International Organization in 2000 in Manchester. That was a bridge building between the local community and ethnic groups in South of Manchester. And I used to have this interfaith dialogue, interfaith breakfast, interfaith dinners, interfaith seminars. And even the biggest breakfast I had was in Tesco. But the problem is uh, some people, they have objection about that interfaith dialogue because they believe that it's a real cause of uh, pluralism and uh, we are losing the uniqueness of Christ when people are having uh, uh, dialogue and they are trying to find the common grounds, you know. So uh, the objection is, where is the uniqueness of Christ when Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and uh, I'm the life? 
so do you have that sort of the challenges in your interfaith dialogues and uh, when you are working in the wider community uh, i'm talking about the muslim and the hindus and other faiths i don't pretend i pretend i go as i am mm -hmm. and when my muslim friends invite me they don't invite me as muslim they invite me as a christian and they invite me as a priest i go with my collar on i go with my cross on as well i wear my cross Praise the Lord. And don't they don't expect me to talk about Islam when they invite me. They want me to talk about Christianity. And Jesus says, go and preach. And this is our primary responsibility of every Christian. Go and preach and baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the mission and commission Jesus has given to every single Christian. And I am privileged that God has given me this opportunity to go and be myself, being a Christian and witness like a salt. I am the pinch of salt among the Muslim community and Hindu community and Sikh community in Manchester. And we are establishing a lot. We've got lots of things together uh, in Cathedral, Manchester Cathedral. We're doing all this uh, interfaith seminars and dialogues and meetings. This is bringing the community together, and our aim is to proclaim the gospel. Okay. Well, our, there's, a, there's a large Asian community, particularly Christian community in Manchester, because I have started my ministry from uh, Nelson Lancashire, and I have very close experience. I studied in Manchester University. The community over there, I mean, they are migrated. For, they migrated from India and Pakistan. They are coming with the experience of uh, persecution, and you 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 were working in the Asian Church as well, so you had a, a different uh, a variety of the ministries. You know, you you are working among the Muslim and the uh, other faith. You know, like interfaith practitioner, and you are also working in the um, white British community and in the Asian community as well. What sort of the challenges you had that in the Pakistani Asian Christians? In priority complex, mm -hmm. in priority, we as a Pakistani Christian, most of us are under in priority complex. Mm -hmm. That complex we had in Pakistan. Like in my class, I remember now, in my high school, we were only three Christians in that school. And those two Christians, they never attended Islamiyat's subject, uh, uh, session class. Mm -hmm. Islamic study, they never went for that because they were so scared. Mm -hmm. But I love Islamic studies. I always gave, got 50 out of 50 in Islamic studies. And that gave me confidence. Because the impurity is when you are not able to speak and defend your own faith. Yep. And that's the inferiority complex we as a Pakistani Christian are having. I never had that experience. I used to go and have dinner with my Muslim friends, used to go and drink with them, milkshake and all sorts of things, eat with them, play with them. I never had that, uh, that complex because I was so confident. Yeah, I understand there is a communication gap because people, they don't want to make friends, you know, from the other yeah. faith. And uh, you're absolutely right that uh, there's an infertility complex because we are coming from that sort of a background where they are always depriving the Christians, you know, and uh, they are being neglected and marginalized. So there's no doubt in that. Hmm. Do you think that uh, uh, as there's a one faith, single faith schools, Independent Asian churches are uh, very important, or they need to integrate with the uh, with the English speaking uh, churches. Because some people they have the uh, uh, impression that they need to worship in their own language, and they want to set up their own separate Asian churches, Urdu Hindi speaking. I think uh, worshiping in your own native language is very very good. We should not forget about that because 
this is very important to pass our culture and language to our uh, younger generation. Like my my two daughters, they like singing uh, in uh, Punjabi. They sing Zabur and uh, they know Lord's Prayer by heart, and they play with me as well in Urdu, and they enjoy it. But many times they don't understand. They they don't understand the words and the meaning and the background. But if we want to survive, I always encourage my Asian congregation to be the part of the mainstream church mm -hmm. where you belong to. And the language should not be any barriers because all our children, they speak better English than us. Yeah. Okay? So that's why they need to mingle with this culture. They need to be integrated into the, into the English culture because we have come all the way from Pakistan to live in this culture. By force or not, we have to learn English. Without that, we cannot get the citizenship. Life in the but, UK uh, is must. Uh, uh, sort of interruption, but uh, Father Falakshir, uh, my, my uh, question is here yeah, on the behalf of the Asian Christian community. Because sometimes uh, uh, the other churches, I'm talking about the uh, white churches, they are not very receptive. And that's why the black community and the Asian community, they are setting up their own uh, small churches, you know, I think they are some uh, people, they are having the home groups because they, they believe that uh, people are not very receptive and they're saying, no, uh, this is only for English speaking or for one community church, you know. And uh, here in, in, uh, in London, there's a big problem with that uh, sort of the mindset. So do you think that church is ready to accept uh, the people from other uh, countries and uh, they are ready to accommodate them? Anglican church is very open and there's a lots of variety in uh, Anglican church. An Anglican church is very open to all the nationalities, all the cultures, and they're very accommodative. In my two churches, I've got two parishes. I'm a rector of two churches. I got two churches and four congregations. In my first church, St. Woodbrook's Church in Cholton, I got English congregation and Asian congregation. The Asian are majority from Pakistan. So we worship in Urdu at four o'clock. And in the morning, we do uh, services at, uh, in English. In my other church, we got um, English service and we got Ugandan service. So they worship in their own language. We got Persian churches in our diocese, which is growing. You are right, sometimes it's misunderstanding. It's a lack of education because one lady, I used to have my open day, open house in, um, in our house. And I was uh, told that this particular lady hate the smell of the curry. I invited her and I told her, if she don't like curry, I will make a plain omelet for you. She came, she was 80 year old. She never tasted curry in her entire life. Yes. And she went for second. Mm -hmm. And the rumor spread, she went for second. <laughs> Until she tasted the curry, yeah. she didn't understand what curry was all about. So that's what we are, me being Asian priest in the Church of England, when I, I'm always interviewed, they ask me, what are you going to bring in this parish? And I always say, I'm going to introduce the theology of curry, <laughs> theology of hospitality. You, 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 are, you are the bridge among the communities. Over yes. There. So they, unless they taste, that's the same thing happened in St. Books as well. There was some um, discomfort among, among the more, uh, English congregation and the uh, Asian congregation. But I brought them together and the food was the main thing which bring them together. Once they started smelling the curry, they were okay. So we need to bring, uh, 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 keep working together 
So it's not only from them, it's from us as well, unless they experience curry, unless we experience their uh, uh, muffins. So this is both way to go. Well, Felicia, nowadays we are uh, uh, actually giving reflection about uh, the role of the church in the 21st century. I mean, with all these challenges and uh, with your activities in the wider community, what we can offer to, to the mainstream church and uh, I'm talking about the denomination, our leaders, and what we can offer to the congregation because there are two actually set of groups, you know. I'm talking about the bishops and the, the moderators and all the uh, leaders, uh, those who are uh, leading the uh, clergy or the congregation. And the second group is our congregation. I'm talking about the mixed congregation, Asian, black community, and uh, English uh, people, you know. So what we can offer to them uh, with our limited knowledge and with our limited challenge, you know, there are so many issues like cultural issues, language issues, uh, our accent, you know, our color. So what, and what we can offer to them and how we can be uh, successful in our ministry and how we can take uh, the wider community under the one umbrella. Sorry, there's too many questions in one. <laughs> yes. I always say, encourage my uh, Asian people that God has brought you all the way from Pakistan or Asia, India, or Pakistan or Africa um, as um, uh, black Asian um, 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 vocations. So God has brought us here in this country for a purpose. If you want to survive, there is a lots and lots of uh, uh, opportunities here and the limit is sky. If you got the potential in, in yourself and if you believe that God is calling you to serve in the church, there are huge opportunities. There is so many opportunities. Like in my church, my church warden is Asian from Pakistan. My treasurer is from Pakistan. So there are opportunities. We've got um, uh, Asian women, Pakistani women who are being ordained in the Church of uh, England. We've got Pakistani priests. So many are serving within the Church of England. One of the priests is Archdeacon of uh, Don Costerno, Javed uh, Reverend Javed uh, Bhatti. So he is um, uh, become. So there are so many opportunities within the Church of England and in a mainstream church churches. And if you see the potential within yourself, the church is very very encouraging and especially to the minority ethnic groups, the, the vocations. We are promoting the vocation. Me being a vocation advisor in the diocese, we are promoting the uh, ethnic minorities vocations. Those, if we see the potential in somebody, I always encourage them to go for. So we as an Asian uh, can serve the Lord in, uh, in England um, if God is calling you, the harvest is great, but the laborers are very few. So nowadays, when people are going through very difficult uh, time, you know, due to that coronavirus and uh, lockdown is there. So, what is your uh, role in this lockdown? Uh, because we are appreciating the NHS, we are appreciating the police, and uh, we are uh, very much impressed by the army because they are playing very important role at the moment in the community. And uh, so many people, uh, they are neglecting the role of the priest in the community because uh, you are performing the funeral, you are visiting in the hospital, you are paying visit to them, you know. So what are the challenges in front of you in this, uh, um, in this time when people are so afraid and uh, um, how you are exercising your ministry? I think the coronavirus has seized the whole world. And the law of the land is the law of the church in England. We have to obey the law of the land. And as the prime minister advised, the church of England follows the same advice. The church being um, closed. <clears throat> and uh, now I think uh, we are working more than in a normal routine when the coronavirus was not there. Now we are working more because it's more difficult to learn new things zoom and uh, website and internet and all these things you have to create but now jesus 
the message of good news is reaching to every single house and every single individuals. People are watching and uh, uh, praying in the bedroom with their mobile on, with their computer on. And we are, uh, the clergy is uh, entirely working very, very hard. We are do doing so many funerals. We, are, we have to ring people. We have to talk to people online. Uh, unfortunately, we can't go and visit them. Uh, but on Easter day, I took the Blessed Sacrament on the streets of Manchester. I bless each and every house with the Blessed Sacrament on my, in my hands. And uh, we are working very, very hard. And uh, day and night, we are praying for individuals, families. That's particularly our um, uh, responsibility as well. So I think church is playing a very, very vital role uh, during this uh, lockdown. Lockdown. What is your uh, future plan uh, in your ministry? How you want to expand your vision? I really appreciate that uh, you have the wonderful partner, Rina. She is working along with you. And uh, she's taking care of the girls and uh, she is part of your ministry. So what is your vision? I'm talking about you and Rina because uh, Rina is not at the moment with you. But uh, one day we'll ask her to come and uh, uh, join you. So what is your vision? My vision is harmony. I wish for harmony. I long for bring your people together, Lord, in the circle of unity. Yes. I'm trying to bring this. We talk, we talk about interfaith. We talk about um, uh, our own community. There's a need of unity among our own Christian community, among yes. our Asian community, among the wider community uh, where we are living. So my wish and my vision is bringing harmony. That's what I started this Harmony International. Wonderful. Beautiful. What sort of message you want to uh, convey to our viewers because people are watching you not only in UK, in Pakistan, in Canada, America, all over the world, wherever there is a, uh, internet, you know, Bible, Bible TV Global is there. What message you want to pass to our viewers in these crises? What you want to say? I just simply want to say, stay safe and pray together. Those who pray together, they stay together. And we got this uh, prayer chain, the global prayer chain, which we are making every day. So let this chain be strong. So throughout the world, when I pray, uh, when I do night prayer at nine o'clock. My Muslim friends join for night prayer. Christian friends join from uh, all over the world. So this is a global world which is shrinking very, very narrow now. So pray together and stay together and make the most of it. As you mentioned about the Zoom and uh, your broadcast in your online service, what sort of the message you want to give to the community about the digital uh, ministry? Because we have started the digital Bible study. Recently, we have started the Digital uh, Bible Institute. Uh, so what is your experience of this uh, digital ministry? You know? Because people are living in, a, in different areas, but through this media, you're reaching to them. So what is your experience of this uh, uh, media ministry? I think internet is a blessing from God. And inter can, internet can reach in the hidden places as well where you can, cannot enter, internet can enter. So take as a blessing, internet as a blessing, and make the use of it. Because uh, through internet, we are having this spiritual communions. Like we can't do a Holy Communion. I'm doing, I'm lucky because I'm doing with my family. But we need to have this spiritual com uh, communion. As we have, because, and that could be online as well. Because you can hear the word of God, you can hear the wisdom, you can uh, hear the songs and pray. Uh, so much material on internet. And like this uh, Bible TV is one, uh, one of the uh, beautiful things uh, Reverend Noble has um, uh, started and he's serving through this. Uh, and Bible TV is serving the nation and the nationalities and God's people wonderfully. Thank you very much, uh, Father Felixier. 
uh, giving us uh, your precious time. I know that uh, um, there are so many things we can uh, we can expand that uh, discussion and this uh, um, this talk. But uh, I understand that you are a very busy person, and uh, uh, there's a burden upon my heart that we need to pray for all the victims of the coronavirus. Those who are in the hospital are at home. We need to pray for the prime minister because he's going to deliver the speech on uh, on this Sunday, and. Uh, there's a there's a burden upon his uh, upon his shoulder, you know, and uh, he himself suffered a lot. So please pray for our Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson and uh, pray for our community, and uh, the, especially for uh, the ministers and the people those who are working on the front line. And then so thank you very much. Please uh, thank you. Thank you. Lord God, we give you thanks for this opportunity you have provided us. So I can talk about my ministry, about my life, about my testimony. Lord, we ask you to bless all those who hear this talk. Bless this Bible TV. And bless all the families, Lord, who are affected by the coronavirus. Heal them, Lord, restore them. And Lord, we pray for Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his whole cabinet. <clears throat> Give him and his cabinet your strength so they can serve your people with love and care. Lord, we ask you to be with us and keep us safe today and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Father Felixier, and uh, our next sitting will be uh, where you, you will be uh, sharing the word of God. Or, uh, sorry, this program was uh, in English, but uh, I hope you get some, uh, because people are watching in uh, India and Pakistan as well. So please accept our uh, apology if you fail to understand uh, the whole interview. But uh, at the next time when uh, Father Felixier, he will share the word of God. I believe you are sharing this word of God in Urdu language. So um, please extend over and regard to your family. Uh, and uh, I pray that may God give you more strength and wisdom. And God bless you. And God bless you, uh, viewers. Uh, please keep watching. Thank you. Thank you.